Ulysses S. Grant was one of the most influential Americans of the 19th century. He led the Union Army to victory during the Civil War and later helped steer the nation through Reconstruction during two terms as president. There are several things you may not have known about Ulysses S. Grant. First of all, although he was always known as Ulysses during his youth in Ohio, Grant's given name was actually Hiram Ulysses Grant. His phantom middle initial is the result of an error from Ohio Congressman Thomas Hamer, who accidentally wrote the future general's name as Ulysses S. Grant when he nominated him to attend West Point. Despite Grant's best efforts to correct the record, his name stuck, and eventually he accepted it as his own. Find some name beginning with S for me, he joked in an 1844 letter to his future wife, Julia Dent. You know I have an S in my name, and I don't know what it stands for. Ulysses S. Grant was also notoriously unlucky in business. After spending a decade in the Army and serving with distinction in the Mexican-American War, he resigned his post in 1854 and spent the next seven years flopping as a farmer, a real estate agent, and a rent collector. He once had to eke out a living by selling firewood on St. Louis Street corners, and when the Civil War erupted, he was toiling away in obscurity at his family's Illinois leather business. Grant would later try his hand at business a second time after he left the White House with equally disastrous results. A financial firm he started with his son and a man named Ferdinand Ward went belly up after Ward fleeced its investors, and by 1884, Ulysses S. Grant was bankrupt. It was only after the posthumous publication of his memoirs that his fortune was restored. General Grant struggled to secure a field command at the outbreak of the Civil War, but was later placed in charge of a regiment of Illinois volunteers and quickly promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The first display of his trademark aggressive style came in February 1862, when he forced the capitulation of some 15,000 Confederates at Tennessee's Fort Donelson. No terms except complete and unconditional surrender can be accepted, he famously warned the garrison's commander. The victory marked the first time in the war that a full Confederate force was captured, and grateful Northerners inundated unconditional surrender Grant with cigars after it was reported that he smoked one during the attack. Before the war ended, Grant would accept the surrender of two more rebel armies at Vicksburg, Mississippi and Appomattox, Virginia. General Grant's taste for strong drink first became problematic in the early 1850s when he was reportedly forced to resign from the Army for being caught drunk on duty. He swore off alcohol for most of the next decade, only to fall off the wagon during the Civil War. Grant's penchant for binge drinking was usually kept in check by his teetotaler adjutant, Colonel John Rawlins. But rumors that he was intoxicated during battles swirled around him for most of the war. For his part, Abraham Lincoln appeared unperturbed by the gossip. When a group of congressmen once alleged that Grant was drunk, the president supposedly responded by asking what kind of whiskey the general preferred. I urged them to ascertain and let me know, Lincoln later said, for if it made fighting generals like Grant, I would like to get some of it for distribution. General Grant received numerous demerits for his unkempt uniform during his days at West Point, and his distaste for military dress continued even after he assumed supreme command of the Union Army during the Civil War. Unlike many of his epaulette-wearing contemporaries, he rarely carried a sword and often took the field clad in a civilian hat, mud-caked boots, and an ordinary private's coat with his rank stitched onto it. One observer who saw Grant during the war described him as an ordinary scrubby-looking man with a slightly seedy look, as if he were out of office on half pay. General Grant was invited to join Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater on the fateful evening of April 14, 1865, but was forced to decline after he and his wife made plans to visit their children in New Jersey. He was informed of the president's assassination when his train stopped later that night. Grant later described Lincoln's death as the darkest day of my life and bitterly regretted not having been at his side. Despite being a potential target himself, 
he was convinced he would have somehow stopped John Wilkes Booth from pulling the trigger. When he accepted the surrender of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in April of 1865, Grant offered generous terms that paroled Confederate soldiers and officers and allowed them to return to their homes. He even permitted the men to keep their horse and mules for use as farm animals. Grant believed leniency was critical to achieving a lasting peace, and he was furious when a federal grand jury later negated the terms of his agreement and charged Lee and several other Confederate generals with treason. During a subsequent meeting with President Andrew Johnson, he stated his intention to resign the command of the Army rather than execute any order to arrest Lee or any of his commanders so long as they obeyed the law. Unwilling to lose Grant's support, Johnson reluctantly dropped the case. His time in charge of the Union Army notwithstanding, General Grant was a political novice when he was inaugurated as the 18th president in 1869. He'd never held any elected position, and he'd shown little interest in running for office before the Republican Party nominated him as its candidate. Critics would later blame his lack of experience for the economic turmoil and scandals that dogged his administration, a claim that Grant himself acknowledged. It was my fortune, or misfortune, to be called to the office of the chief executive without any previous political training, he wrote in his final message to Congress. Under such circumstances, it is but reasonable to suppose that errors of judgment must have occurred. After the newly formed Ku Klux Klan began murdering and terrorizing black Americans in the late 1860s, President Grant mobilized the Justice Department and secured thousands of indictments against their leaders. In 1871, he oversaw passage of the so-called Ku Klux Klan Act, which armed him with the power to declare martial law and suspend habeas corpus in areas deemed to be in a state of insurrection. The law got its first test later that year when Grant sent troops into South Carolina and ran thousands of Klansmen out of the state. Thanks to his administration's efforts, the hooded extremists were effectively cowed into submission over the next few years. They wouldn't resurface as a force until the 1910s. Grant first began compiling his memoirs in the mid-1880s, after he wrote a series of popular articles about his Civil War experiences. He was on the verge of signing a book deal with a magazine when novelist Mark Twain swooped in and offered a much more lucrative contract with his newly formed publishing firm, Charles L. Webster and Company. Grant took Twain up on his offer and later finished the book just a few days before succumbing to cancer in July of 1885. The personal memoirs of U.S. Grant hit stores later that year and was also immediately hailed by Mark Twain and others as a literary masterpiece. It was also a massive bestseller. Only a year after the book was published, Twain presented Grant's widow, Julia, with a royalty check for a whopping $200,000. And it was today, January 21st, 1880, that former President Ulysses S. Grant visited Key West and was the guest of honor at a dinner at the Jefferson Hotel. And that's what happened today in Key West history. Today in Key West history is brought to you by 43 Keys Media. To find out about our glorious past here in the Florida Keys, visit 43keys.com. You can get this show as well as others as an Alexa Flash Briefing. You can also find us on YouTube and anywhere you listen to podcasts. So subscribe wherever you're listening. And in the meantime, we'll see you over at 43keys.com. 